Yeah, great. Okay. Perfect. You guys are live on YouTube. You're ready to go. All righty. Thank you very much. So, um, hi, everyone. My name is Hauke. Um, I am a software developer and an electrical engineer. And uh, I am here to tell you about some of the data loggers I built for our research institute. So um, I'll be basing this on two systems uh, that I will be talking about, but in between there'll be little asides and uh, just a lot of, uh, I hope that some of my experiences will be useful to you um, if you're working on this kind of stuff or if um, uh, you're just interested in using Raspberry Pis and Perl for, for similar applications. Uh, first, a few words about my employer. The uh, Leibniz Institute of Freshwater Ecology and Inland Fisheries is uh, the largest research institute for freshwaters in Germany and worldwide. It is one of the leading research institutes in this area. So uh, some of the topics that we cover are um, uh, aquatic biodiversity, so um, aquatic organisms, not just fish, but also microorganisms and, um, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, and uh, insects. Um, the sustainable use of fresh water, so as drinking water for uh, sports, um, the conservation of this resource, um, the effects of global warming, and so on. Um, one of the um, main topics of the Institute is the communication with the public, so um, that is uh, communication with government agencies, with companies, but also informing the public. It is the support of open access software, and uh, it is the um, support of, um, sorry, open access publications and open source software. So uh, that's why I'm here today, and so I'd like to thank my employer for giving me the time to talk to you guys. Um, so first of all, why do I use Raspberry Pis so much? Um, I, I like them a lot because they're, they're small, they're very well, uh, um, they um, are very good for building data loggers. Uh, they use uh, relatively low power. So for example, the Raspberry Pi Zero W that you see at the top right here um, is, uh, takes about 85 milliamps, which makes it uh, good for battery powered applications. Um, they run a full Debian-based Linux distribution, so all of the packages that you know from a regular Debian Linux distribution like Ubuntu, you have them uh, available on the Raspberry Pi. Um, the community around uh, Raspberry Pis is, is relatively large. Um, they have really good support. If you have any trouble with them, uh, there's usually already a forum post about them somewhere, and uh, there's a lot of companies selling peripherals uh, for them. And um, so, so with other similar single board computers, uh, there are lots out there, um, but I, I feel like you just don't get this uh, large community of support uh, that's available for Raspberry Pis. Um, of course, nothing's perfect. Um, so for example, uh, Raspberry Pis always need a, a fixed five volts input. And since we do a lot of work with battery powered applications, um, we almost always need to add a voltage regulator um, so that the Raspberry Pi can get its five volts. Um, and also uh, making the power down user friendly is uh, not as easy because uh, the Raspberry Pi uh, can't turn itself off like a regular PC can when it's done shutting down. Um, so getting that to be user friendly can be uh, a little tricky and, and often requires extra circuitry. Um, I also thought about using Docker on Raspberry Pis. This is uh, possible on the larger Raspberry Pis, um, but unfortunately, uh, last time I checked, it didn't work on the Raspberry Pi Zero W. My idea there was that um, you could package up your software into a single image, and that way you could it would make uh, sort of firmware updates in that sense easier for your users. So. Um, that's something that if, if it works again, and I, I have some experience with that, I'll, I'll be happy to update uh, you on, on, all, on that. So the first measurement system I wanted to talk about is uh, this uh, one that you see here. It's um, the basic idea is that when, when we're talking about the transport of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, uh, there are two processes. First of all, you have uh, large scale movements. So big masses of, of gas that are uh, moving with the wind. Um, but the second process is very small scale, you know, on the order of uh, centimeters 
um, little turbulences, little eddies. And so um, the, the uh, measurements with these kinds of uh, eddies are called eddy covariance. And um, this is an important process in the transport of greenhouse gases. Uh, and there are existing airplane mounted uh, systems to, to measure this. And at the Free University in Berlin, they have built uh, their own measurement system for this. And that's what you see, <clears throat> excuse me, that's what you see here. So um, this is uh, a, a wing pod. It's normally used uh, as a reserve fuel tank, uh, but in this case, it's been modified to house the measurement system. And uh, what you see sticking out in the front there is called a five hole probe. Uh, simple name because it has five holes. And the idea is that um, the, based on how the wind, based which direction the wind is streaming across this probe, um, there are slight uh, pressure differences between those holes on the tip of the probe. And so uh, with some complicated math, you can calculate back to get a wind vector. Um, and then that's combined with a highly precise greenhouse gas measure, uh, measurement device. So that measures CO2 and methane in this case. And um, then with a high frequency of measurements, you can get um, uh, these uh, small scale uh, eddies of, of air. You can, you can measure those. So um, this is what it looks like inside. Um, first, we have a GPS unit uh, that is also an inertial navigation system. So you not only get the uh, uh, position of the airplane, uh, you also get its orientation and so on. Uh, then we have um, temperature and humidity. So basic meteorological parameters. Um, we have uh, various temperature sensors um, that are connected to an analog to digital converter. Um, and then we have the pressure sensors that are connected to the tip of the probe. All of these sensors, uh, their data is collected on a Raspberry Pi, and that's what I wrote the uh, code for, and uh, so that's what I wanted to talk to you about. So first of all, what uh, data streams do we have? Well, the, these are all connected to the Raspberry Pi via USB. Um, the GPS unit has uh, one G USB connection that provides three virtual serial ports for different data streams. The uh, temperature and humidity sensor is uh, fairly simple. It's just one virtual serial port over a USB connection. Uh, protocol is uh, simple with um, uh, text-based data, line-based data, so uh, it's pretty simple to process. Um, the one exception is the analog to digital converter, which has a special piece of software, but in the end, all that outputs is text-based data, so we just need to record that. And then, of course, we have the four pressure sensors that are connected to a uh, RS-485 interface that provides four virtual serial ports. So all in all, that's nine data streams, eight of which are virtual serial ports. So I've spent a lot of time um, on that topic, on the topic of, of serial ports. So uh, as many of you know, the um, uh, Unix uh, has had support for serial ports forever because uh, you know, it's one of the very basic interfaces. Um, and so uh, you would normally do that with the stdy command to configure the port, you know, set the baud rate, set the number of bits, parity bits, and so on. Um, and then you have this device file that you can treat more or less like a regular file. You can uh, read from it, in this case with cat, to see uh, the data that's arriving at the port. You can write to it to send data to the port and so on. And that's, that's the, really the very basics that you need. But um, of course, that's not really enough. We also want uh, to log when does this data arrive because a lot of the sensors don't have their own internal clock. And uh, we want to check whether the data is valid. There might be records that got cut off because the sensor got unplugged or uh, there might be noise on the line that causes transmission errors and so on. So, well, that uh, seems pretty easy too. You know, we know the Unix principle, we know Perl, we can pipe it into Perl, uh, check the data, add a timestamp. And, you know, that's, that's again, very, very simple, very basic idea of how this could be done. But of course, it's, it's, in reality, it's not that simple. Um, we also want this to be very robust. In, during the flight, uh, depending on uh, what measurement equipment is being flown, there's a weight limit for the airplane. So it may be that there can't be a second person in the airplane, it's only the pilot. And in that case, the pilot has, has no time, since he's busy flying, has no time to monitor the measurement system. So we need it to be very robust. Um, 
that means that it needs to restart on failures and so on. So uh, that's uh, one thing that we need from the system. The other thing we want is uh, in the lab, we want this to be user friendly so people can just unplug and plug the sensors back in and not worry about uh, whether this works or you know, whether to, they have to restart the logger or not. And we also wanted to serve uh, live data to a web interface that would run on a tablet that's mounted in the front of the airplane. Um, and this was useful for the pilot to show various meteor meteorological parameters. It could be used to show the status of the measurement system. So in case there's some major failure that the pilot knows that there's no point to continue flying and he should land and have the measurement system checked. Um, so that's why we wanted a web interface for this. So the very first version I wrote of this used the module device serial port. You may know this, it is uh, basically a port of the uh, Win32 serial port module that is basically the module to access serial ports on Windows. Uh, and it works well. Um, I just didn't find it as uh, elegant to use as a regular file handle. It does provide a file handle interface, but that is only emulated with Perl's tie. So for example, you can't use these file handles in a select system call. Um, it's, I, I found it uh, tricky to configure timeouts, especially uh, if you wanted to receive line-based data. You know, it's easy to set a timeout per character or per, per packet, but um, lines are a little different. Uh, so um, again, it worked well, uh, but I, I felt like the next interfaces that I'm gonna show you on the next slides were, were a little more elegant. I use the module daemon control for uh, controlling the daemon. It uh, also uh, writes uh, LSB init files, which I thought was very nice. And uh, it's, it's just, a, I felt like a nice daemonization module. Uh, in this version, there was no live data view yet. Um, so this was really just the very first initial version. Uh, it is uh, still part of the repository. So in case you're interested to see um, what uh, code with the by serial port would look like, um, which is very similar to the Windows version, uh, then uh, this is all in this repository here um, where you can uh, look that up. At this point, I just wanted to also mention uh, one, one thing I found really useful. If you're working with uh, plug and play devices and USB devices, UDEV makes, uh, is, is really useful here. So normally, um, when you plug in USB devices, um, they uh, just get numbered in the order that you plug them in. And when you boot, um, the order in which they initialize could be different every time. So um, with these UDEV rules, you can say, uh, uh, match, you can specify matching rules that say, uh, okay, for this device, I want you to take this action. So in this example here, it would create a sim link in the dev folder that is always linked to that specific USB device. So that's really useful. Um, and there's also lots of other things you can do with it, like running scripts when you plug in devices. Uh, there are more filters available. So if you want to match serial numbers, for example, that all, all of that is possible. So this is something I found really useful uh, for this kind of an application. So uh, the next version I wrote um, used the module IO uh, term IOs. I, I hope I'm pronouncing that uh, correctly. I found no reference. I searched for a while, but um, I hope that uh, I'm, I'm just gonna call it term IOs. Um, and I found that this module made working with the TTY files a whole lot nicer. So these are real file handles. They have a file descriptor and everything. You can use them in select. Um, so I found this to be uh, a lot cleaner in that sense uh, to uh, work with um, uh, uh, these serial ports. Uh, you can use it together with the Perl module iOS TTY, which is basically the Perl version of the command line tool that I showed you earlier. Um, and I wrote a little article about this on Perl Monks. So uh, if you're interested to see some example code uh, that's here, this uh, presentation is online. The slides are already online. So um, if you want to look at this, these are all links here. You can click on them later um, if you want to see that code. I also included a little example of uh, using the module, uh, sorry, the program SOCAT, which um, even though it's called SocketCat is actually a very versatile tool. You can use it to create fake uh, TTYs. So uh, that's really useful for testing your serial code if you don't have the sensor available. 
Um, now, in the end, uh, if I wanted this to be non-blocking, uh, I wanted it to have timeouts and so on. And that did end up being a fair amount of code that I put into its own module. So um, that uh, ended up being kind of a little bit of a reinvented wheel there. Um, so, you know, it, it worked very well. Uh, this, this version of the code is actually the version that is still being used uh, in, in, in uh, operations today. Um, but I still felt like, you know, there's probably a little better way to do this. Um, I wrote one, there's one daemon that gets started per data stream, uh, per serial port. So um, again, this works really well, but it's a little uh, uh, inelegant to have, you know, nine daemons floating around uh, plus the web server and so on. Um, the web server I implemented with uh, Plaque, and uh, I found this a lot nicer than regular CGI PM, um, but still, again, it's, it's kind of low level, let me put it that way. It's, it's, uh, it's really nice, but it's low level. So uh, later on, I used Mojalicious. I'll show you that on the next slides, and I found that to be much uh, nicer. Um, now, at this point in the project, we're a little bit out of time, and so I uh, implemented the data exchange uh, via the file system instead of, you know, a more elegant method like a database or so. Um, but again, this worked. It's really robust. Uh, as far as I know, there haven't been any failures of the system. So, you know, I, I, I felt like uh, it's a good setup, but um, I felt like I also I had reinvented a couple of wheels and um, I, I always had this feeling like there must be a more elegant way to do this. And in a later project, I had the chance to uh, try that. Um, this uh, is a very similar application talking to serial ports. The difference is that in this application, we um, uh, didn't need a web interface, although that would have been relatively easy to implement. And um, we uh, uh, wanted to connect to the serial ports over TCP. So I used uh, PoE for this, that's the Perl object environment. And despite the name, uh, it's not an OO framework, it's actually an event loop framework. So if you know, for example, any event, it's something similar to that. And I, I feel like there's a really powerful, really nice uh, set of modules. There's a lot of pre-written components. You, it's really easy to implement TCP servers, TCP clients. Um, IRC bots, uh, there's modules to handle line-based data sources and so on. Uh, so I felt like it was better in that there were a lot of uh, a lot less reinvented wheels. Um, but the API of PoE is a little complicated. It takes some getting used to. Um, and uh, it's, you know, once, once you get into it, it's fine. But again, I felt like maybe there's a little more elegant way to do this. Anyway, it did simplify things in that now there's only one process um, that is in PoE called the kernel. Um, and everything happens non-blocking event-based. And so I could tie in basically as many serial ports as I wanted. I used the IO term IOs um, uh, module again here. Uh, I opened a TCP port per um, serial port so that uh, various clients could connect to it and read data. And if they wanted to, they could send data to it and so on. So, Again, I, I, this was good and um, it worked well, um, but uh, for the next project, I tried uh, something else. And uh, that, was, that project was last year. Um, it was uh, for this, uh, it's not on the airplane now, this is a separate system. Uh, this sensor that you see here is a CO2 sensor and it's waterproof, which means that you can hold it into rivers, lakes, the ocean, uh, and measure the CO2 concentration there. Uh, this was uh, this had to be battery powered, so I used uh, Raspberry Pi and an Arduino for the uh, data logging. I put it all in its uh, own enclosure, so it has a battery. Um, all the circuitry is in this box that you see here, and then the researchers can uh, hold this uh, into the water. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> so. Um, the, uh, like I said, there's an Arduino for data logging because that uses a lot less power, about a tenth of the power of the Raspberry Pi. And um, then when the researcher wants to connect to the data logger with their smartphone to either see the live data or to download uh, the log files, uh, they can turn on the Raspberry Pi separately. Um, what the Raspberry Pi then does is opens a Wi-Fi access point and uh, runs a Mojalicious web server. 
um, so uh, that the uh, researcher can take their cell phone and connect to that uh, and have a live data view in the field or download the data files and so on. Um, and then the Arduino and the Raspberry Pi communicate via, via their internal interfaces to exchange the data. Um, on the client side, I used the JavaScript event source API. So um, if you haven't heard of it, there's a lot of uh, hidden links in my presentation. So actually this here is a, a link that you can click on later if you wanna learn about that. Um, basically it's a, a server push API and it's easy to implement in Mojalicious. Uh, of course I could have used other things like WebSockets or so on. It just seemed easiest in that moment. Um, next month, I'll be building two more of these data loggers, and I hope to use that opportunity to clean up my documentation and so on, and I hope that I'll get a chance to publish the designs uh, and the code for this um, uh, sometime this year. Um, as I've been working more and more with Mojalicious, I've really uh, gotten to like it a lot. You know, it's uh, asynchronous, uh, non-blocking, event-based, um, and I, I feel like it has a really nice and elegant API. And I just wanted to show you sort of what the architecture uh, looks like uh, for with Mojalicious. So again, we have one process. Uh, in this case, there was only one serial port, but if you could easily extend this to as many uh, serial ports or other data sources as you want. Um, I use uh, the uh, TermIOS module again to get a file handle and in Mojolicious, the IO loop is called Mojo IO, the event loop is called Mojo IO loop. Um, and it provides the module Mojo IO loop stream for handling file handles that include sockets and so on. And uh, I added the uh, line buffer module um, which then provides events uh, for lines. So normally the, the, the stream module provides events for data received, uh, closed, um, error, and so on. And then line buffer adds an event for received lines. Um, this uh, by itself is already enough to uh, log things to a database uh, or to a file. And uh, at this point, I just wanted to mention that there are um, Mojo-based modules for uh, accessing databases that are basically wrappers for DBI. Um, but you know, there's the Mojo PG uh, for Postgres, there's one for um, MySQL, there's one for SQLite, there's one for Redis. Um, there's probably more, I, I don't know off the top of my head, but I found uh, that their API is just really nice. It adds some sugar to, the, to DBI. Um, and, and makes it integrate a little ni uh, nicer with Mojalicious. <clears throat> so to serve this to the clients, um, I parse the lines of data, I turn them into uh, uh, Perl data structures and I send them to a Mojo event emitter object. And um, that is, as the name says, it's an event uh, um, based object. So um, I, I uh, tell it to, uh, I give it the data and then clients can register as listeners on that event emitter object and they receive the, the data packets as they come in and then they can distribute them to their clients. Um, like I said, I used the JavaScript event source API in this case, um, but of course you could use a regular socket server, you could implement uh, web sockets or static HTML, whatever. That's one of the reasons I really like Mojolicious is, um, you know, it provides all of this in one package with a unified API. So um, uh, it makes all of this easy. And um, like I said, I, this, this code uh, for this specific data logger isn't published yet, but I did publish a simplified example um, of this on Perl Monks. The link is down here. Um, so if you wanna look at that there, you can. So this is a, another system that's on the aircraft. This has less to do with Perl and uh, more to do with what I said at the beginning that there's a lot of uh, hardware uh, that uh, gets sold for Raspberry Pis. In this case, it's a GPS receiver chip. Um, and the thing is that a lot of GPS receivers uh, provide a signal called PPS or pulse per second. Um, and what that is, is a high precision time signal um, to, uh, that's synchronized to GPS time. And uh, that is provided on a pin to the Raspberry Pi. And the Linux kernel can actually uh, handle that signal. Um, and then a daemon like Crony, for example, that's an NTP service, can use the PPS signal to um, uh, provide a highly accurate system time um, that's synchronized with GPS time. So we have uh, this Raspberry Pi running in uh, the aircraft 
and uh, it is a Wi-Fi access point, it is a DHCP server, and it is an NTP server, so that all of the measurement systems in the aircraft, because there are several ones, all use the same time base, which is, of course, very important when you're logging data and you want to synchronize it. Um, the instructions for how I built this um, and how to configure the Raspberry Pi are also part of this repository that I linked to earlier, so you can look that up as well. Okay, little change of topic. Um, I wanted to talk about the uh, systems that we're using for our current measurements. So in uh, my department, uh, that's department one, eco-hydrology at the IGB, um, I am currently mostly working with the group uh, landscape eco-hydrology and their focus, uh, to put it generally, is um, precipitation and the water cycle. So uh, it may seem simple, but it's actually uh, can get very complex. So um, when it rains, uh, there are parts of that water go different places. Some of it runs off into lakes and rivers. Um, some of it evaporates directly off of the ground. Um, some of it um, goes into the ground uh, and is immediately taken up by vegetation and can return to the atmosphere from there. Some of it goes deeper into the ground and transitions over into groundwater. Um, and so the uh, focus of the group is to uh, quantify these uh, different um, uh, amounts of water. Where does the water go? How does it uh, distribute? And they're actually using a really interesting technology called stable isotope tracers. And so what this means is there are stable isotopes of water um, that occur around the world in different distributions. And um, based on how, uh, uh, so in different relationships to one another. And um, because these are measured around the world, and uh, so we know generally what uh, distribution of isotopes there is in the rainwater, and that changes over time, we can use these as natural tracers. So for just for example, um, what the group does is they take ground samples at different depths, and uh, they analyze, they extract the water from those, they analyze them in very specialized devices to measure the different isotopes of, uh, of water. And uh, then based on um, the several samples over time and different depths, you can actually see um, the water wander down through the different levels of uh, the earth. Um, and uh, you can see how rainwater gets distributed. Um, this, all this data is then fed into computer models. Um, and then these computer models can be used to, for example, predict um, the effects of global warming, can uh, be used to uh, affect the, uh, um, to predict the changes um, due to different vegetation and so on. So one of the research areas is uh, the city of Berlin. And uh, there's another area to the east of Berlin in the state of Brandenburg. And that is uh, where I, where these uh, measurement sites that I'm going to show you now are located. So we have two weather stations, um, and they measure uh, the normal meteorological parameters, so uh, wind, temperature, humidity, rainfall, and so on. Uh, they also measure, measure solar radiation, and they measure uh, two components. That's the solar radiation that comes down from the sun directly, um, and what is reflected back up from the ground. And uh, there, is, uh, there are also ground-based sensors. So um, they measure, for example, the soil heat flux, meaning um, what heat energy goes into the ground or is leaving the ground at night. Um, they measure uh, soil moisture. Uh, they measure soil temperature and so on. So um, you know, that's how you can get these parameters uh, that I talked about uh, for the soil as well. Uh, then there are, uh, we have, there are separately from that soil moisture sites. This is what they look like when they're installed. This hole will be closed up later. Um, and what you see here is, is uh, sensors that measure soil moisture at different depths, starting at about 10 centimeters down to a meter. Um, and uh, compared to the um, sampling of the soil, where you only get a, a momentary picture, um, these measure 24-7. Uh, and um, so you get data, for example, is showing that when it rains lightly, um, that water may not penetrate very deeply into the ground at all because it's all immediately absorbed by the vegetation. Or when there's heavy rain, you can see it wander down through the different layers of the ground. 
Um, and uh, you can see how long that takes and so on. So that's why these sites are important. Um, and then uh, we have so-called sap flow sensors. And these basically measure the flow of uh, water up tree trunks. So how much water is a tree taking? I talked about this briefly in, in Riga last year. Um, these sensors, they're basically two metal rods that are inserted into the tree trunk. Um, they measure the temperature difference between the two uh, rods and um, one of them is lightly heated. And so what that means is when the water is moving up the tree trunk quickly, so when there's a lot of water, it carries the, the heat um, energy and then the temperature difference between these two rods is uh, lower. And uh, when the tree is not taking up so much water because one of the rods is heated lightly, the temperature difference between the two rods will rise. And uh, based on this data and um, on some calculations on the, the area of the tree and so on, you can um, estimate uh, how much water is this tree taking up, which is another component of the water cycle that I showed earlier. So I wanted to talk briefly about one of the things that we're doing with Raspberry Pis here. Um, uh, the two weather stations that I showed on the previous slide, one of them already has an internet connection and the other one uh, doesn't yet. So um, luckily there is a uh, Wi-Fi network in a building nearby that we have access to. Um, however, the data logger itself is kind of old school in its communication capabilities. It only uh, knows PPP, it knows FTP, maybe HTTP, but really not much more. It doesn't even know ethernet. So, um, Normally what you would do is you would go out and buy a modem from the manufacturer for several hundred dollars. Um, but we thought, well, let's try doing it with a Raspberry Pi. Uh, obviously it can easily connect to the Wi-Fi network and it has a hardware serial port that can connect to the data logger. And then uh, all we need to do is run a PPP server on it. So uh, that's relatively easy to do on Linux. And, um, and then it's connected to uh, a um, switched 12 volt output. So a switched power output, because this is battery powered, we can't run the Raspberry Pi continuously. And so basically this data logger treats this Raspberry Pi like a regular modem and uh, you know, old school modem. And um, this is something again, I, I hope to be uh, able to publish some instructions on how I, how I did this. Um, sometime soon. Unfortunately, I can't nail down the time frame yet, but um, hopefully this year or so. Uh, so I also wanted to talk about just two little asides here, some things that I learned uh, while working with all of this data that I thought might be useful. So um, at uh, the beginning, I talked about how we have nine different data streams. And um, of course, uh, when we're analyzing the data later, we want uh, this, we, we only want to work with the data where we have all of the data streams at the same time. The sensors take different amounts of time to initialize, there might be gaps in the data and so on. So that's what I've tried to represent here. Um, just an example with uh, two data streams here. This is, so this shows, uh, you know, we have some data coming in from one of the data loggers and then maybe there's a gap uh, where there's no data because it's still initializing or something. You know, some more data comes in, another gap, some more data. And then finally back here, the second data logger comes in. Um, and here, this period of time back here is what we're actually interested in because that's where we have data from all of the data loggers. So um, I wrote some code um, that I've uh, posted on Perl Monks. Um, it, is, it uses the module set in span, which made it pretty nice that based on the timestamps, I can uh, look at um, the different data streams. I can look at um, when do we, when are there gaps, you know, so when might one of the sensors have failed for a short amount of time, or maybe there were errors in the data stream. And I can look at for which periods of time do we have data from all data loggers at the same time, because then we want to cut our log files based on that. So that that's the data sets that we then feed into the processing software later on. Um, I turned this into a script as well. And so um, if, uh, if this kind of thing is interesting to any of you, you know, these, you can click on these links and look at the code, how I did that. The other thing um, is uh, 
in, you know, I talked about how our two weather stations will have internet connections, but then we have a whole bunch of data loggers that we read out manually. So we drive out uh, on average once, once a month um, and download the data from the data loggers and we get it as CSV files. And um, uh, the data loggers internal memory when you download the data is actually not cleared. So every time you download new data from the data logger, you get basically the entire data set. And that means we have a ton of duplicate records. Um, and I wanted to just stuff these into a database and uh, not really worry about um, uh, whether there are duplicates or not. So in terms of SQL, you know, one data record is just a regular insert. And then when there is a duplicate, I wanted it to either be ignored or updated. It doesn't really matter because it's a duplicate. It should be identical. But I also wanted to identify if there ever was a case where uh, the timestamps, which should be unique, have different data, because that would indicate a serious error somewhere, you know, a clock that was set wrong or something. And so uh, this is a question I asked on Perlmonks and I got uh, the, the nice tip that this could be done at least in Postgres with a, uh, a trigger. And uh, so then I also posted uh, the uh, trigger SQ, the SQL code um, that I used for that. So uh, you can look at that on, uh, at this link here. So finally, uh, what's going on at the moment? Um, aside from the data collection that I talked about, I am working on a, um, a server, a central server for all of our data streams. Um, this would this will handle the um, uh, FTP uploads from the weather stations, the CSV imports from the data loggers that we read out manually. It'll store this data. Um, it actually already does. Um, and uh, it will disseminate the data to other databases. So for example, we have at the IGB a database called FRED. Um, which is the Freshwater Research and Environmental Database. And this is publicly available. Um, you can uh, download uh, our publicly available data sets there. Um, so if you're interested in that kind of thing, you can uh, do that there. Um, and I also want to implement a uh, kind of a live data view. Um, so both for, for myself to see if the sensors are still working for our scientists to get a quick overview and also maybe interesting to the public uh, to look at, um, you know, what's what the weather data currently says. Um, and so I gave a lightning talk in Riga last year about a prototype of an interface using the JavaScript uh, Plotly library and uh, my web pro project. Um, and that's also something that um, I will be putting on the server. Now, the URL is here, squid.igb-berlin.de. Um, there's nothing there yet, um, but uh, I do hope that, um, well, again, maybe sometime by the end of the year, um, there you should be able to see some of our publicly available data there. Um, and this, I, I should mention, this uses Mojolicious. This is entirely written in, in Mojolicious with uh, Docker and um, you know, FTP server and so on. So um, this is uh, one of the reasons that I've been using Mojolicious more and more recently. And it's been, it's been going really well. It's, I've uh, enjoyed working with it. So um, yeah, that's uh, already my talk. And um, I see that I have managed to stay in my time. So if there are any questions, I uh, would be happy to take them now. Okay. And I think, I'm not sure if I can unmute you if you need questions or if I need one of the moderators to help me out here. Yeah, and I, I believe everyone has the ability to unmute themselves if they okay. want to ask a question or okay. here Santiago has a question. Yes, I see the raised hand. Okay. Yeah, so at some point you were mentioning that uh, you were playing with UDEV rules. Yes. Uh, did you, um, when writing these UDEV rules, were you passing, uh, were you calling scripts written in Perl or were you using uh, some other um, bash scripts or so? And if you were using Perl, mm -hmm. uh, any module in particular? Um, so uh, I was not calling Perl. In this case, I was only using them to, um, uh, 
set up those uh, sim links so that I could have reliable names for the uh, USB devices. Um, I, uh, so I, unfortunately, I don't know off the top of my head if there are um, specific Perl modules for that. I, I do know that you can call any Perl script, basically. Um, and I would assume that you only need a, a module if you want to interact with UDEV further than that. You know, if um, I, I, I think that UDEV passes certain values, uh, I'm not sure either on the command line or, line or in the environment. Um, but uh, if you need, I think if you need further interaction with UDEV, then you would probably need a, a, some kind of module for that. And unfortunately, I, I can't tell you which one there. Um, cool. Thanks. But for basic stuff, you know, like run just even just running a script is uh, is is pretty easy. Yeah, I I remember that. So I was just mm. uh, trying to figure out if there was a particular model. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. I see uh, William. Yes. Hi. Um, hi. I uh, just a quick question about uh, the Raspberry Pi ecosystem. Could you just go over? Um, loading Perl, what versions you use and how difficult it is to get things off CPAN, uh, yeah. what, how that whole process works. And I'll okay. mute myself. Um, it works like basically any other Linux distribution. So it, Perl comes pre-installed. Um, I, I, I am trying to remember, I think it's either 526 or 528. Um, and uh, then uh, you can, so it's, it's like any other Linux distribution really. Um, you can use local lib, which is something I did. You can use the um, apt get to install um, uh, packages coming from the Debian repositories. Um, and the, you know, you can install cpan, uh, cpan m or so cpan minus and install modules that way. It's, it's uh, the only thing to consider is that the Raspberry Pi, so for example, the Raspberry Pi Zero W is, uh, it's a one gigahertz uh, processor. And I think the Zero um, only has one or two cores. So if you compile stuff, especially if you want to compile Perl, that takes a long time. So um, as long as you're prepared for that, um, it's, it's like any other Linux distribution. And, um, I actually prefer getting my modules off of the Debian repositories um, when I can, just because it's so much faster to install that way. Um, that limitation, I think the newer Raspberry Pi, so the Raspberry Pi 3 and 4, they're fast enough so that compiling stuff isn't that much of a pain. Um, but on the, all the other Raspberry Pis, it, it does just take a while. That's, that's really all. Um, and it's a, obviously it's a different processor architecture arm uh, instead of Intel. So, but I, I personally, I haven't run in, into any trouble because of that. So yeah, mostly like a regular Linux distribution, just slower. That's, that's the summary. 